Father in heaven, we thank you again for this Shabbat that we can enjoy. Father, we invite you into our presence. We ask that you cleanse our hearts and minds, that your spirit can truly speak to us and show us things to come. Today we're looking at things to come. And Father, we ask that you give us understanding as we look at these things, these so important things. We pray in Yeshua's name. And I'll tell you what, I don't care whether you're male or female, you don't want to be alone and parlaying with the devil. You don't. He's a specialist on getting you to go this way when you should be going this way. And he's actually come into the church now, and he's laying stories out. He's laying false prophecy out. He's mixed up the whole thing, and now he's got people going this way when they should be going this way. The only way that you can deal with this guy is know the voice of of the shepherd, of the true shepherd. And there's a trick to knowing that. And part of that knowing is knowing his character, knowing what he would ask you to do and knowing what he wouldn't ask you to do, knowing what he would do and what he wouldn't do. And we're going to look at some of those things that are going to deal with his character um, in a little bit that will demonstrate what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say right now. We'll get to those verses here. So we can see because of the fall, Adam was now going to rule over his wife. I don't believe in the creation it was going to be like that. They would be co-rulers. They would talk together. They would be united and they would work together. It would be like, if you will, a king and a queen type of thing. They were the king and the queen of this earth. And they were both supposed to rule together. But because of the fall, it became necessary because Eve, and don't take this sideways, please. Eve became a prime target for the enemy after the fall. And God saw fit to make the man rule over the woman. I believe this will be reversed. This will be reversed. And it will no longer be like that. It will be different. No, I don't believe the woman will rule over the man at that point. But when the serpent is destroyed, this is the thing. When the serpents, we're going to look at these. We've looked at that briefly. When the serpent is destroyed, it will be a different order of things. And there's some of those things are going to change. This is because of the curse. This happened because of the curse. When the curse is taken away, the very first verse, all the, the outcomes from the curse will be reversed back to their original state. This, to me, is fantastic news. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble, for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of Jehovah. Here it is, right here, Isaiah 65. This is a kingdom verse. This is a, after the recreation, This you back up a little ways, and it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. And this is how this thing plays out. This is tagging on to that the wolf will lie down, and so on. This is right following that. It says, they shall not labor in vain, they shall bring forth children, they sh or nor bring forth children for trouble. So, if they're not going to bring forth children for trouble, that's the old way. That's the way it is today in this world. So, if they're not going to bring forth children for trouble, what are they going to bring forth children for? Why would this even be mentioned? What are they going to bring forth children for? Pleasure and happiness and joy, right? That's exactly right. And they, because they are the descendants of the blessed of the Lord. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So those that inherit the earth, and we're going to look at these verses, those that inherit the earth, according to this verse, are going to have children. Isn't that what this says? Sure, this is what it says if they choose. And their offspring, so they're going to have grandchildren, a 
and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so on. God's original plan will be fulfilled. Genesis 3.17, then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, because his wife was telling him to transgress, go against God's command, then this is what happened. This is the curse that the man had. So we've got seen the serpent curse, the beast of the field, now are subject to the curse that was brought on. Now we've seen Eve had a curse. Now Adam gets his curse. And you have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat it all the days of your life. Now, has anyone done some gardening and you're sweating out there in the hot sun? Yeah. Is it fun? Not really. Because you're fighting weeds, right? Yeah, you're feeding. That's why you're doing it. You're watering. You're doing all this stuff that you're never going to have to do again. Now, I'm not just going to say you're not going to have to garden again or you're not going to want to garden again. But you're not going to be doing the battle with gardening the way it's done today. You're not going to be doing it. Um, but this is part of the curse, and it's good for us. Now, I take this further to say that God's plan for man was they would have to sweat to create an income for their family. This is part of his plan. Because if we, let's back up a little bit, if we had no night here, like it's going to be in the kingdom, and there was no night here, and the weather was perfect every day of the week, and we were wicked, wow, we could be wicked for 24 hours a day. That'd be just so wonderful. I wonder how fast this planet would self-destruct if people were wicked for 24 hours a day because they didn't have to sleep. Well, there is way, you know, you can drink Red Bull or whatever. You can go a lot longer and be wicked. But the idea being is that God has given us sleep so that we're not wicked 24 hours a day. That, in his mercy, we get tired. But when wickedness is finally destroyed... There will be no need for that. There will be no need to slave away in a garden anymore because we're not going to be getting uh, all this work done just all by itself and we're off just doing whatever we feel like doing in wickedness. And so that's why God has cursed the ground so we actually have to produce something in order to make a living. We won't eat unless we sweat. That's the idea. Unless we work, we don't eat. And Paul talks about that, a man that doesn't uh, look after his family, shouldn't eat as well. And it's just, so he's given us this so that we can keep busy. The children of Israel in the wilderness, they were given a job, right? As soon as they got into the wilderness, that was to build a tabernacle and to do all of this. He gave them things, all gave them all things to do. Now, you guys, and I know, Seven Tasha, I know, because I've heard this from your kids, I know that you would actually make them dig holes and fill them in a bit again, just so that they had something to do. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> you had to keep them busy. Idleness, idleness is the, the devil's workshop, right? And this is what God says. So, you know, kids, don't hold it against us because God has said this, and we know this. And so we have to give our kids things to do. Uh, and it's to our advantage that we do. And it's ultimately to your advantage that we do that. So at least you know, still don't hold that against me for all those things I made you do. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is going to be reversed. And we have a promise for that as well. Both thorns and thistles it shall uh, bring forth for you. Nice. It's, not, it's for you. It's for our benefit. It's going to do this. And you shall eat the herb of the field. So now we go a little lower. Instead of the original diet, instead of the original diet that God gave us, and that would not have included any flesh foods. It's just things that were growing on the trees and on the plants and so on. But because of sin now, we had a restriction. What was the restriction? We couldn't eat from the tree of life. And the tree of life was to enable us to live forever. So we couldn't 
eat from the tree of life. Some of these herbs of the field are good for something. What are they good for? Medicine for healing, right? So these things are for healing. These things that originally we wouldn't have to eat are now good for healing. So we're going to get nutrients out of these things, possibly that the tree of life would have had in it. And so because the tree of life that gave life and well-being and everlasting life, it likely had nutrients in it that we need for eternal life. And I obviously can't explain all of that. But God saw fit when when the tree of life was removed, we would have to eat the herbs of the field. Now, I suggest that in the new kingdom, we won't have to eat those anymore. We won't have to eat those anymore. And uh, that, to me, is going to be great. Uh, Not going to have to have salads anymore. Salads are really good for you. We're not going to have to eat those kinds of things anymore. We'll be able to eat mangoes and watermelons, nectarines, yeah, oh, wonderful stuff, cherries, all kinds of things like that. And um, never have to kill any animals anymore. That would That would be nice. Uh, that would be really nice, wouldn't it? Some of us have given that up a little bit early just to get ready. That's what you guys do, right? And are you benefiting from it, do you think? Sure you are. Especially with the viruses coming around, all kinds of diseases and, and things like that. So, uh, so we were, because of the curse, we had this added. So we can assume this will be taken away in the original diet, Genesis 129, I believe, original diet will be reinstated. That's all of God's pleasure that he had in mind for us at the beginning. goes on to say in Isaiah 65, this is the chapter we're looking at, uh, about bringing forth children and the wolf lying down with the lamb and so on. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So these are things that we're going to be able to do. And the idea is, is you're not going to be building in somebody else and have it. You might help somebody uh, or something like this, but you will build houses, you will inhabit them, you will plant vineyards, you will eat the fruit of them. It goes on to say, they shall not build in my kingdom, they shall not build in another inhabit. Except you're building a pretty nice house right now. Would you like to live in that house? Wow, you'd like to live, but you could probably never afford to live in a house like that. But if you had the kind of money he did, and you could live in a house like that, then would that be nice to live in a house like that? Think of having all the resources that you would need into in a kingdom that's far greater than you could ever imagine, and you got to build your dream home. What would it look like? When I think of that, I think of Swiss Family Robinson. I'm going to live in a tree, and I'm going to be able to swing from tree to tree, and I will have my pet monkeys to have some fun with. They go back and forth and back and forth. But I can, the house that I want to have is going to be a living house. You know, we have a little sawmill down here where we cut up firewood. I don't have, I have this idea that we're not going to need gasoline and we're not going to need sawmills and we're not going to need this and that, is that we will be able to build our houses out of living things. Wouldn't that be cool? Because there will be no more death. Oh, I missed one point there. It says that my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now, I don't know about you, but I've done work that I have not enjoyed. And my hands have taken a beating, and they're in pain, and they're bleeding, and so on. But the work, the kind of work we're going to do in the kingdom is not going to bring pain. We're going to enjoy the work that we're doing with our hands. Revelation 22, 14, it says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they have, may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of into the city. And I believe this to be talking, obviously, in uh, Revelation 22. This is the new Jerusalem. This is the headquarters 
of the universe, if you will. This is after God makes his throne here in this world. The throne of the Lamb and the throne of the Father will be here in this world. And we shall reign with him forever and ever from the earth. And uh, there's so much more that's involved in that uh, promise we're not going to have time to get into. But we will have a right to the tree of life. Therefore, as we've just looked at, our diet will be completely changed uh, as well in this kingdom. goes on to say, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Jehovah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This covenant promise actually is a declaration from way back in ancient times to the very end. This will actually, this promise will not be fulfilled until the very end, after the millennium. And he will write his law in our hearts and in our minds, and we will no longer stray. And that's why we shall reign for how long? Ever and ever. Because we've learned that lesson of obedience. We will no longer stray. He will have written this process that's going on right now where he's writing. He's writing his law in our hearts and our minds. But at this point, when the covenant promise is completed, he will have written his law in our hearts. And we will no longer stray from his commandments. And it will be declared that these are my people. He goes on to say, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Jehovah, for they all shall know me. From the least to the greatest of them, says Jehovah, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now this is very interesting, because a lot of people, when they get into prophecy, they get things in the wrong place. If you notice that, this prophecy actually belongs over here, and this prophecy belongs over here, and we get things mixed up. But if we look at exactly what it's saying... It says, saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me. So apparently there's a time in, in the future coming when everyone alive in the earth will know the Lord. When will that time be? It has to be after the thousand years. Because we're going to look at this, that there's wicked people that are going to be resurrected at the end of the millennium, and surely we cannot say that they know the Lord. So there will be a time when that destruction happens, and that everyone left standing after that destruction will know the Lord, and we will no longer have to teach anyone about him. That promise won't be actually uh, realized until after the millennium. That's a great promise to hold on to. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all, or sorry, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. This is a promise. This is a promise about the end, the day which is coming shall burn them up. Sayest the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, that will leave them neither, what? Okay. So let's look at this now. Let's look at the context. There's a day coming that will burn all the wicked up. All that do wickedly. When does that happen? It has to be at the end of the millennium. If it's at the beginning of the millennium, if wicked people are raised at the beginning of the millennium, it can't be said that at the millennium, at the end of the millennium, they would be resurrected because this says the figure of speech that leaves neither root or branch. When you pick a weed out of your garden, what's a good idea? Get the root because you know if you get the root, it's not growing back. 
So this promise is not going to be fulfilled until the very end of the millennium. This is not until it's going to be fulfilled, neither root nor branch. And they will be completely consumed, and that's why those left standing will be all righteous. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, Yeshua, shall arise with healing in its wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You will prosper. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be, they shall be, they shall be, pardon me? They're gone. Well, aren't they going to burn forever? But isn't there an idea that they're going to burn forever? Okay. There's an idea out there, and I'm sure if you've uh, heard, uh, I'm sure you know about this. There's an idea that God is going to burn the wicked forever. Has anyone heard that? So my Aunt Millie, that didn't understand about Yeshua, or stole the loaf of bread because she was hungry, is going to burn forever and ever. Now, when... When we need to understand something, you have to think about how does this fit with a righteous God? How does that, does that fit that, that somebody that just decided not to be in the kingdom is going to burn forever and ever? What does the scripture actually say here? Read it for me. They shall be ashes where? Under your feet. Okay. Now, the Bible talks about a fire. Let's just see if we can get this going. The Bible talks about a fire. Now, for you guys that know about fire, what does a fire need? Let's bring this from the bottom. Okay, what does a fire need? It needs oxygen. What else does it need? It needs fuel. Okay. So it needs heat would be the fuel. Well, fuel, sorry, that would be the paper here, right? Okay. And it needs heat. Correct. Now, what has just happened? What is it? Okay. Now, what's just happened? We've had fuel, and we've had heat, and we've had oxygen. And now we have ashes. This is what God was talking about when the wicked will be ashes under their feet. And we're going to get to this promise, is that the wicked will be consumed by fire. And when the fuel, what is the fuel in that case? Right, the wicked are fuel. As long as it takes to burn the wicked up, they will become ashes, so to speak. Now, I don't believe, I believe this is a figure of speech to help us understand that the wicked will not live on somewhere in some place called hell. And for eternity, I got to think of somebody that I knew that was really close to me that's screaming that they're in so much pain. No. If that had to happen, God would have to create another miracle for that person to be able to withstand the fire. No, they will be resurrected. The fire comes down, and it says they will be consumed. They will be devoured by the fire and left as ashes, which ashes will go into the ground. We're not going to be walking on ashes for forever. They will go into the ground when everything's recreated because there will be a recreation that happens after this. All right. Let's keep going. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. This is when the promises inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The meek shall inherit the earth. And God goes on to say, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure.
accomplish. So here we, here we have it, the promises of the gospel. We're going to get more into this. We're going to start working backwards and see how we get to here as well. This declaring the end from the beginning. So God declares the end. And now what we're going to go is we're going to get into the prophecies and work backwards to where we are today. August 8th, 2020. And what is going on in the world and how we can see these events taking place in our world today. A lot of people don't understand. They, they see some events here and they see some events here, but they see nothing of how we're going to get there. And this is what we want to do because all these prophecies are promises. And as we see these prophecies unfold, it gives us strength and courage to keep going forward. So let's, let's close with that verse and that, those promises. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your wisdom, your pleasure that you are going to come uh, bring to pass. And Father, we look forward to that day. And we ask that you help us to be on the right side of what's going on. And Father, we give you full permission over our minds to lead us and guide us into ways of righteousness. And Father, we want to ask that you send your spirit, the spirit of Yeshua, into our hearts to keep writing your law in our hearts that one day it will be completed and we will never stray or wander again. We pray this in the name of Yeshua.